Before beginning, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to the memory of Malcolm Stokes, who some of you may know as the author of the book On the Boundaries of Kenwood, which is on sale in the house. He died a few days ago. Now let's go into the talk. Um, in the past, the talks have mainly dealt with paintings. In this case, I'll be talking about land, but you'll find that there's an awful lot of the human in discussions of land. I'll be concentrating on three particular episodes. The first takes us back to the age of Henry VIII, and particular, particularly if you're familiar with it, with the atmosphere that you get in the writings of Hilary Mantel and C.J. Sanson. The story is based on a document which has come to light in the archives of the Hampshire Record Office. And it all starts with a young man, well, he wasn't actually so young by that stage, John Palmer. He was the son of a Warwickshire landowner. And he came up to London as a young man seeking his fortune. He had really very little to his name except, which was important at the time, for a coat of arms. He was a squire. And he was a squire in a world of merchants who aspired to become gentlemen. And in 1509 or 1510, somewhere around there, he made a good marriage. He married a woman called Eleanor Taylor, but Taylor was actually her married name. Her husband, John Taylor, had died a few years earlier, leaving her with a lot of land. But she already had a lot of land and a lot of wealth because she was the daughter of the cofferer to King Henry VII, in other words, a member of court. And her brother, Robert Palmer, well, Robert Cheeseman, was one of the wealthiest men in Middlesex wealthy enough to be portrayed by Holbein, and here you see him in his portrait. The hawk that he's carrying was more a sign of wealth than a sign of office. And you can see this sort of nervous look about his face. He was a man who was also extremely ambitious, and in the 1530s he acquired a lot of land as a result of the dissolution of the monasteries. However, as of 1536, he had neither wife nor child, and his heir was John Palmer's wife, Eleanor. But through his connections with Robert Cheeseman, John entered into the circle of Thomas Cromwell, and soon he became one of his gentlemen and was being put forward for promotion in the king's service. And in the course of his familiarity, in the course of his work with Cromwell, he came to know the next generation of rising young men, and particularly William Paget and Thomas Risley. These two men, successively and sometimes together, acted as secretaries to Henry VIII, and they were very, very keen to increase their own personal wealth. And of course, John increased his personal wealth through being associated with them. And if we move forward to 1534, you can see that John Palmer was an extremely wealthy young man. Now at the back here, you can see John Roke's map, which is 200 years later, of our neighborhood. And what you need to forget about are the ponds here, which were only to be created in the 1690s. But otherwise, the countryside was much as represented on this map. And John owned all of the land north of Millfield Lane, which you can see here, 
He owned all the land to the south. He owned lots of land in Kentish Town. He owned land in Belsize, and he also owned Chalk Farm. So you would have thought that he was rich enough, but he was not as rich as some of his neighbours in Barnet. I mentioned that John's wife Eleanor had first been married to a Mr Taylor. Well, Mr Taylor was based in Barnet, where he had lots of lands. And what you're looking at here is the earliest surviving map, or map of Barnet. It dates from somewhat later, but you can see that basically Barnet hasn't much changed. There's the church and there's the market house at the intersection of the two roads. And up here is Hadley Wood, which we'll be talking about later. Now, in Barnet, also lived another very wealthy family, the Stanfords, who had originally come from, from Staffordshire. And the rising hope of the family was William. Now, William was later to become a famous lawyer and to be knighted. But as of the 1530s, he was just training as a lawyer, but he came of a rich merchant family and a merchant family that was on the rise and desperate for the coat of arms which John Palmer had. Now, William Stanford was only a couple of years older than John Palmer's oldest daughter, Alice, and it seemed obvious that they should marry. But there was a problem. It becomes very clear that Alice really, to be frank, couldn't stand William's guts. But the marriage had nevertheless to go ahead. And you can imagine that there were all sorts of complicated negotiations before progress was made. And it's at this stage that Kenwood, or rather what was then called Kenwood Fields, enters the story. Now the Kenwood estate had historically been owned by Holy Trinity Aldgate. And because nothing remains of Holy Trinity Aldgate, most people have no idea of how important it once was. So I'm showing you here this map of London made by Matthew Paris, a St Albans monk, in about 1250. And in his view of London, which incidentally is probably based on the view from Highgate, he has distinguished the most important buildings. So for instance, you can see the St Paul's Cathedral, you can see London Bridge. Wrongly placed on the other side of the river, you can see the Tower of London. But highlighted is the abbreviated form of La Trinité, which is Holy Trinity Aldgate. So it was important enough to be featured as one of the most important buildings and institutions of medieval London. However, it had been dissolved in 1539, and in a complicated set of arrangements, Ken Wood had passed from Holy Trinity to Waltham Abbey, which was itself soon to be dissolved. But before it was dissolved, in March 1536, John Palmer took out a lease of lands on the Kenwood estate owned by Waltham Abbey. So now let's go to the map and locate exactly where those lands are. Now, the fact that John Palmer acquired the estate in 1535 is known and recorded, for instance, in the Survey of London volume. But the Survey of London volume then jumps to 1542. And of course, it doesn't tell you why he acquired the estate in the first place. Well, he acquired the estate as a pledge of good behaviour. By 1536, John Palmer was already in his 50s, and it was quite likely that he would die. William Stanford was desperate for the marriage to take place and wanted a guarantee that it would. So having acquired the lands in March 
1535, which is presumably when the negotiations for the marriage started. In the following, in the June of the following year, on the 6th of June, 1536, John Palmer transferred this land to William Stanford and his daughter, Alice Stanford. And it's worth, or Alice Palmer, and it's worth reading the description of what was transferred. He transfers all his lands, leases, meadows, pastures and woods in the parish of St Pancras lying on the south side of Kenwood and Giles Hort and the estate is now commonly called Millfields, you, can, you see about the continuity of, of names in our neighbourhood, or Kenwood Fields and also, also otherwise called Millfield, Huntfield, Fernfield, Gutterfield and Knights Grove with certain small crofts hitherto adjoining and I suspect that those small crofts or buildings were probably the predecessors of Millfield Cottage which is still on Millfield Lane. All which premises do bound and abut on Hatch Lane or Kenwood Lane which is Millfield Lane and the lands of the said John Palmer on the east the said Kenwood and Gillis Hort on the north, Hampstead Heath on the west, and the lands late westral to the south. Now, if that was all that was in this indenture, you would have thought, well, what's the point of the talk? But I'll tell you why. It continues from the land to discuss the terms of the marriage. And we learn something quite extraordinary. William and Alice were going to get married but Alice was going to continue living with, his, with her father. And Alice by that time was not, no longer a child, so it's, it's her will. Let's read what the indenture says. For the further advancement of the said Alice, John Palmer binds him, himself and his heirs and executors by this indenture to pay unto the said William 50 pounds, that's the, the dowry and when it was to be paid. And also the said John binds him and his heirs that the said John at his own proper cost shall sufficiently and newly apparel and array the said Alice of all manner of apparel and ornaments belonging to the body of a gentlewoman. And that in two manner of sorts. That is to say, he is to pay for two new gowns of cloth with wide sleeves of velvet, two kirtles of camlet, two bonnets and frontals, and so forth. So there is the kirtle, and there you see exactly how Alice was to be apparelled. There's a gown above and then the yellow is the kirtle. You can see the bonnet and you can also see the veil. So Alice was going to have two of those just to prove that she was a gentlewoman and not any old sort of girl whom William might have found. And it goes on. The said John, by the space and time of four years next and immediately ensuing the said marriage, shall find at his own cost and charge, charges, she will find him her, an honest chamber within the house of the said John, where she shall lie with bedding, hanging, and all things thereunto belonging, and also fuel and candles. And also the said John shall find Alice meat and drink at his own table by all the said term of four years and meat and drink and lodging for her maid by all such time and times as, shall, as it shall happen that the, the said Alice to be lie, <clears throat> to lie in her childbed or otherwise sick. In other words, for the first four years of the marriage, Alice is going to live, continue to live with her father. She is going to be treated particularly especially and even her bedroom is going to have tapestries and so on, so that if anybody should go into it, and remember in those days, bedrooms were a presentation space, people would see immediately 
that she was a gentlewoman. John would also look after, his, after her servant. But how about William? Well, here we get a real clue as to how tetchy relations were. Because in the deed, John obliges himself to pay for meat, drink and lodging within his own house for William and his servant when he visits. But only for two days. If John was to stay, if William was to stay any longer, he was to pay two shillings and eightpence per week for his board and lodgings. Well, this was hardly an auspicious start to the marriage. And I think it breeds, mute, <coughs> it breeds mutual distrust. But it looks as though, at a superficial level, the marriage works. You saw that the indenture talks repeatedly about four years. Well, after four years, William, clearly having been satisfied that the terms were being abided by, surrendered the estate back to John Palmer, who sold it in 1542 to Thomas Risley. And as for Alice and her husband, well, they continued to have 13 children. And they were quite prosperous. They bought, they moved to, to Hadley and managed to buy most of the land between South Mims and Hadley. William himself had an extremely successful career as a, as a lawyer and became, and he was knighted in the course of Queen Mary's reign. He died shortly before Queen Mary died, which was probably as well, because by that time, the family had turned Catholic. And he and his 13 children by Alice, or the 13 children by Alice, had a rather sad fate. It wasn't a good thing to be a Catholic under Queen Mary, under Queen Elizabeth. And by the end of the reign, they, had, they were no more than squires of Perry Bar near Birmingham. But Alice married again. She married Henry Ke uh, Roger Carey, who, who lived in South Mims, and by, by him she had a last son, Henry, who you can see here. This is his monument in Hadley Church. And it is with her, husband, her second husband, not with her first husband, and with her youngest son, that Alice was buried, Suspect, suggesting that at the end of the day, though she'd had the 13 children, the marriage had not brought her the happiness that her second marriage brought her. And by 1626, when her son Henry died, we were well into the second story, which I'm going to be telling you. But before we turn there, um, I'd like to remind you of some surviving relics of this story, which you may not be aware of. One of them is the Eleanor Palmer um, Almshouses in Wood Street, High Barnet. Eleanor Palmer was the mother of Alice. And th these, these uh, almshouses are financed by the income from houses from the Palmer estate, you'll remember, in Kentish Town. And even more to the point, the name Eleanor Palmer is commemorated in the name of a primary school in Fortis Road in Kentish Town, actually built on the Palmer estates. So it may seem a long, long time ago, but the traces are still there. And now we move from the world of Hilary Mantel to the world of Samuel Pepys. And to the land, not as a pledge, but as a manifestation of social status. It's quite well known that the King's printer, John Bill, was the builder of the first Kenwood house. Now he purchased Kenwood in 
in exactly the year when he was officially appointed King's Printer. And this is a book of the works of, of James I, published by him in 1616, the same year that he acquired Kenwood, and a manifestation of how well he had done. Now, as King's Printer, John Bill was really James I's and the Stuarts propagandist in chief. He was also an extremely efficient businessman. And he was very talented in terms of knowing what to print and where. Most people know that he was associated with the printing of the authorized version. But most people do not know that he was also associated with the printing of the first English Atlas and later of a miniaturized version which included this map of Cornwall. Now, why do I display this map of Cornwall? Well, I display it because you'll notice that across the map, there's a sort of cross. Well, this cross locates uh, Cornwall accurately. It shows exactly where it lay. If people had consulted this map, they would not have run aground on the cliffs surrounding Cornwall. But tragically, this map was only ever printed once and by John Bill. After that, the cross was removed, the location was distorted, and hundreds of English sailors lost their lives through the lack of an accurate map, which could have been created, could have been corrected, had people followed the King's printer, John Bill. Now, John died in 1630, and he was succeeded by his son of the same name. And it was in his, the son's period, that Kenwood first appears on a map. But it doesn't appear as Kenwood, it appears as Major Bill's house. And here you can see it located. Now you might think that in a status con conscious world, John Bill was at a bit of a disadvantage. After all, all he was, was Major Bill. Immediately beneath is the Lord Marquess of Dorchester. And by the time that this map was made, or a few years earlier, on top of the Lord Marquess of Dorchester, of course, you had no less than the Duke of Lauderdale living in Lauderdale House. So did John feel in inferior? Well, actually, no. This is the depiction of the house of the, of the Marquess of Dorchester. Just to locate it, it's roughly where the grove is today. There's West Hill and there's the grove. And as a matter of interest, that little bastion that I've highlighted is still to be seen at the bottom of the garden of number six, the grove. The house was exactly, more or less exactly the same size as the original Ken Wood. Furthermore, it was almost exactly, it was built at more or less exactly the same time, round about, well, this was built round about 1610, 1616. Ken Wood is built in 1616. This house was designed by John Thorpe, the first really famous English architect, who was also responsible for Audley End. And for people who are interested in the history of Hampstead Heath, Charlton House in Blackheath, which was the home of the Marion Wilson family. And this view is probably as close as you can get to the appearance of the original Ken Wood. And now we return to Ken Wood. I've already said that John Bill was the King's printer. He was an extremely wealthy man, but he was not identified at the time as being the king's printer. He is John Bill, Bill of Cane Wood. And in fact, this context provides information about his marriage. He was married to Diana, again a second marriage, who was the daughter of Mildmay Fane, 
second Earl of Westmoreland. So he had aristocratic connections. And Mild May Fane was quite a remarkable character in his own right. He was a commander during the English Civil Wars. He was a writer, he was a poet, but above all, he was extremely well connected. And behind this portrait, you'll see that there's a map. And if we blow up the map, well, on the original, you can actually read the, the names. And what this is, is not an ordinary map. It's a map of his connections. Every, more or less every place mentioned is a seat of a wealthy nobleman or landowner. And this print was made in 1662 when the Earl of Westmoreland was trying to re remind Charles II of how important he was. So that's propaganda, this is propaganda, and Mild Mayfane is linked to Bill. And indeed so linked that in 1661, when his daughter, Diana, gave birth to a daughter called Diana, there was a celebration at Kenwood and the father or grandfather was invited along and afterwards he wrote a thank you poem. And this is it. To my son Bill, upon his entertainment at Kenwood, at the christening of his daughter Diana, June the 14th, 1661. The various canes from several parts are brought, some for I, some for supporter bought. But those of Kenwood appertained to Bill were sugar canes, whence each might suck his fill of such high ent entertainment as did raise content in all and to the donor praise. Well, this, first of all, let me tell you that I've done a bit of investigation about the sugar cane, and I can assure you in these present times that there's no evidence whatsoever that John Bill owned sugar plantations anywhere. So he just bought them. But the second thing that's quite interesting is that clearly at that time, Kenwood was actually being pronounced Canewood. And you ask, is there any lasting legacy? Well, there is. Because south of the, what is now the Kenwood estate, there is Diana Field. And there it is. And it was possibly, it was named after her, after Diana, possibly at the time when the wood itself was removed and it became an open meadow. Now, which Diana it's named after is unclear. John Bill's wife, Diana, who incidentally knew Samuel Pepys, who described her somewhat unflatteringly as crooked, was one possibility. The other possibility was his daughter, Diana, who was commemorated, commemorated at the entertainment for which her grandfather wrote the poem which I've just recited. Anyway, there is a lasting link to the bills in the name of that little meadow, which is now rapidly reverting back to woodland. And now we turn to the third example of the use of the land in the context of Ken Wood. And this time it's land as the key to survival of the house. And we begin by looking at a very familiar image of Ken Wood, where it is described as a superb villa. And it, perhaps it was a villa in terms of size, but it certainly wasn't a, a villa in terms of its importance to its owners, because they ran it as though it were the pearl of a traditional country, seat, country estate. Here we see Lord Mansfield in what I think is a really sensitive portrait of him. Now, it's quite clear that from the start, and here Ian Trackman is the expert, but for, for Mansfield, the core purpose of the estate, were, or the, the, the core features of the estate were the house, the gardens, the model farm, and the 
park, the miniature park, and the rural views that could be enjoyed by his guests. But the, that, that core of the estate was to be maintained by rental income from the more distant parts. And here I can demonstrate what's meant. This is a little known manuscript map made by John Prickett of Highgate, the same firm that today is commemorated in Prickett and Ellis. And it shows the Kenwood estate, or part of the Kenwood estate, in 1803. And what I would particularly want to point out to you was the road running then as now from Hampstead to Highgate. And this line of trees, which marked the area that was wooded in, well, in 1536 when the Palmers took it. And these delineated the home park of the Earls of Mansfield. So when we talk about Kenwood as experienced by Lord Mansfield, we're essentially talking about this area. This is owned by him and run by him and enjoyed by him. Everything to the south is owned by him, but leased to other, others with the income reverting to Lord Mansfield. And if you want the names of the people who are the leaseholders, you can see them listed on the left. There's Mr. Ridgeway, Mr. Coxwell, the Hampstead Water Company, and Mr. Austin. And the map was intended to enable Lord Mansfield stewards to know exactly who owned what and whether the rental they were paying was a fair economic rental. But that's not the end of the story. Here you can see the lane running between Hampstead and Highgate as it is today. And even now you get the feeling that the trees on the left represent a sort of border. And here's a view of about 1790. And there you can see the hedge, which even then separated the home park from the leased lands. You recognize the boating pond and the stock pond. And incidentally, the trees, many of them still survive. And then from the other side, we've got a painting which is described as a view of Ken Wood, which of course it isn't. What it is, is you can see St. Michael's Church on the left, and you can see the house on the site of the Russian trade legation in the middle. But I particularly want to draw your attention to the fences demarcating Hampstead Heath from the Mansfield lands. And this is about 1840. But Mansfield had to work to assemble this estate. At a fairly early date, he acquired the lands around Gospel Oak. But it took him more time to acquire the land that had been owned by John Palmer, the Kenwood, Kenwood Fields. These came his way in 1789 when the Hampstead Water Company decided to sell. But what is quite interesting is that the Hampstead Water Company at that time envisaged the place as being developed. You can see it's an, an estate where the gentleman and builder may exercise their taste in the erection of villas, several of which can be so placed as to command views of wood, water, and the distant views of the metropolis. The only person interested in preventing that was, lad, was Lord Mansfield, who already acquired, or who already had the lands to the south, and he acquired it. And in 1840, the same thing happened when the Southampton lands to the east of Kenwood became available. You can see that in 1840, when Lady um, Southampton decided to sell out, her uh, estate agents had already, in their minds, developed the Fitzroy estate. And you can see here the houses that have already been built, which are in grey, blocked out in grey, and the proposed houses, which are simply in outline. But you can see that this would have been thickly developed had it not been for the fact that it was acquired by Kenwood and brought into the estate. So, by 1840, 
you had the home park, which is marked by the Golden Star. To the south, you have the lease glands. To the east, you have the Fitzroy estate. To the west, you have the land formerly owned by Lord Erskine. But most important of all, and often overlooked, to the north, you had the lands in Finchley. William, the first Elm of, of Mansfield leased no less than 700 acres of land in Hornsey and, Philip, in, in Hornsey and Finchley from the bishops of London. And on the map, I've tried to orientate you by, with the two arrows showing Highgate and Queen, what are now Highgate and Queenswood, and at the top, Coldfall Wood. So you can see it was an enormous estate, including various farms. It was actually far bigger than the whole of the um, Kenwood estate to the south, and rivaling in size um, the, whole of Kenwood, uh, the whole of Hampstead Heath today. So this was an enormous estate that was bringing in a lot of money, which enabled the successive earls of Mansfield to maintain Kenwood at no cost whatsoever to their Scottish estates. And it is quite clear that the earls of Mansfield wanted to convert their leaseholds into freehold. Um, in, 17, in 1811, when an act was passed to enclose Finchley Common, they are mentioned in the act as owners and proprietors of diverse lands in Finchley. They were never owners and proprietors, proprietors. they were only leaseholders, but they dearly wished to turn leasehold into freehold. And under the lax supervision of the Bishop of London, there was a chance of doing so. This, a similar sort of thing had happened with the Fitzroy estate, which was officially owned by the Prebendries of St. Paul's Cathedral, but they too had been lax in their ownership. And the Fitzroy family had sort of persuaded them to turn their estate into freehold. But in the middle of the 19th century, the lands of the individual clergymen, bishops, prebendaries, and so on, were handed over to the ecclesiastical commissioners, the modern church commissioners, and they had clear ideas of developing land themselves for the purchases for, for the purposes of the church. And to that end, they decided that they would have to buy out Lord Mansfield. Part of the price was their surrender of what's now North Wood, but much more important, they had to pay him £25,000 for the termination of his leases on the vast estates, the 700 acres of estates in Finchley and Hornsey. And incidentally, the £25,000 that they had to pay to Lord Mansfield was later recouped by them charging £25,000 for the sale of what's now Queenswood and was then known as Churchyard Bottomwood to the Borough of Hornsey. But in the short term, Lord Mansfield lost his estates and was left, left with £25,000. And here you can see the developments that the bishops of London, the, sorry, that the ecclesiastical commissioners were planning to make. The yellow marks proposed uh, uh, the proposed lines of um, Bishop's Avenue. And you can see that the branch on the right ends up in Manor Farm, which is now actually a part of Highgate Golf Course. And it was Manor Farm that was one of the farms that was bringing in a lot of money to the Earls of Mansfield. They also owned Churchyard Bottomwood and Gravelput Wood. Well, in the wake of this, Mansfield decided to sell up entirely. And in five years later, he sold the whole of the land south of the home park to the LCC for 200,000 pounds. And it's quite interesting that the, what, 80 odd acres of <coughs> the land to the south of Kenwood was worth, well, eight, hundred, eight times more than the leased land 
to the north. But anyway, Lord Mansfield was able to invest £225,000. And over the next 30 or so years, <clears throat> everything went splendidly. Because by investing the money, he was able to generate enough income to maintain the home park reduced to what it ha had always been. I mean, there was no real loss of amenity to him. He was able to use the money to maintain the house and grounds. And everything went splendidly until 1909, when Lloyd George introduced the people's budget and particularly death duties. And with death duties, there was no longer the chance that an estate like Kenwood could continue to, to be sustained. And so the sale became inevitable, even if in the intermediate period, the Earls of Mansfield rented out the house and grounds while looking for an eventual buyer. And at, by this stage, the Earls of Mansfield were certainly thinking of urban development. But luckily, that didn't happen. Thank you very much. And here is a short reading list of selected titles which may or may not be of interest. Thank you very much.